Welcome to Midweek Matters. Um, it is our topic of the month is the world of work. And I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Kali Kohli, who was born in India with cerebral palsy, and she now lives in Wolverhampton. She is married with three children, and she retired from Wolverhampton City Council after working 32 years. That is an achievement. <laughs> She um, runs the Punjabi Women's Writing Group and her poetry, Patchwork and A Wonder Woman are published by Offers Press. She's performed at universities in London, Berlin and Liverpool. She writes for Disability Arts Online. She's performed at the British Museum in London. Yeah. And she has been award appointed the Poet Laureate of Wolverhampton um, to hold that position between 2022 to 2024. She was awarded an honorary doctorate degree, Doctors of Letters, that's a very romantic title, Doctor of Letters by the University of Wolverhampton in 2022. She's involved in various projects around the country and currently she's working on a commission with the National Portrait Gallery on a project called UK Citizen Wolverhampton Punjabi Migration Experience. It is my great pleasure to invite um, to this evening's Midweek Matters, Kali Kohli. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. And, you know, I didn't know what to expect. So I'll go with what you guys want, want me to talk about. But what I'll talk about is the thing with cerebral palsy. In in the U UK with with um in a Punjabi in a Punjabi um lifestyle, so it, it's my experience is very different to a British family experience. So. Well, what I want to start with is my favourite, favourite poem, which is called The Ragdoll, and it's, and it's um, a poem that is about me. And because when I was a child, I had a, I had a ragdoll, and I was seven years old, and the ragdoll was as tall as me. So, you know, very big ragdoll. And that like that inspired me to write this poem. <clears throat> the rag doll. To fellow rag dolls living with cerebral palsy. Silk, linen, velvet, cotton wool, made from all sorts, textured fabrics, button ribbons, hips made from zips. Walk the daisy and fall into bits. Her heart is made of golden fluff. Her smile is shining bright. Now and again she's not there quite. Her spirit shines like ultraviolet light. Droop dangles her limbs and neck. Durable to all types of wear and tear. Broken, damaged here and there. People stare, she just does not care. Battling, juggling, impossibilities. Shining diamond sequined eyes, always ready to give you a surprise, like a cartoon she'll always survive, has trouble with her physical being. Words tangle in the laces of her head, still figuring out what you've just said, jerking, jolting to the day she's dead. That's, thank you, that's, that's my identity poem. And... I think all of you must relate to some of it. So if if you want to talk about what, what I've just written, any questions? No? Any? No questions? Right. <clears throat> I'm going to start with another poem which I wrote, you know, I'd, I had written a novel called Dangerous Games, and it's, and it's um, 
I wrote it and I didn't know what, what to do with it. So I got 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 a manuscript in my hand and I thought, what what do you do with it now? I didn't I hadn't I didn't have a clue. So I met up with my friend who was a published writer and he said to me, go to the library and, and you'll find somebody there to help you. So I went off to the library and I met somebody called Simon Fletcher who was the literature development officer there. And he said to me, have, have you joined a writing group? I said, what's a writing group? I didn't know what, what a writing group was. And he said, it's a group where you got like-minded people and you you should, if you want to write, you should come and join us. So I went along and wrote, and I met lots, lots of people in the group. And I, I felt really shy. I was really, like, I didn't talk to anyone. I was really shy. And then, then we, ha we had to write something and there was like something in the room that we got inspired by and from that in that poem I wrote a poem about um my life and my what I thought is mine and I just wrote it and I showed show, show, show it to everybody. I knew, I couldn't read it out myself, so the, te the tutor read it out for me. And he goes, Collie, this is amazing. What? It's the first time. Really good. So I was so, it made me feel so focused and happy about myself that I could write something that, that was accepted by everybody else. So this is my poem called Mine, and it was published in the BBC News article on in 2020. So I think if you Googled me, you must have seen this poem in the article. <clears throat> and it's called Mine. I have a dream. Please don't influence it. It belongs to me. I have a delicate heart. Please don't break it. It belongs to me. I have peace of mind. Please don't disturb it. It belongs to me. I have to follow a path. Please don't obstruct it. It belongs to me. I have an amazing life. Please let me live it. It belongs to me. I have a choice. Please don't choose for me. It belongs to me. I have freedom. Please don't capture me. It belongs to me. I have incredible feelings. Please don't hurt me. They belong to me. I have a lot of love. Please don't hate me. Love is mine to share. I'm on my material journey. Don't follow me, it won't be fair. So, I have a dream, and it's my dream to be free. Hilly, I just wanted to uh, come in and say that is just incredible. And um, I think, I, I'm just gonna, oh, join you in a minute when I can. There we go. Um, I just wanted to, because uh, obviously you've you've spent, uh, you appear to have spent quite a lot of time in that comfortable space of reading or speaking your poems. But um, the 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 ability to be able to identify with the words that you say is just that that poem just blew me away. So and and I suppose what what I also loved about it is it applies to everybody yeah. whether you, whatever gender you are whatever age you are you know everything it, it is universal poem um so thank you yeah my publisher told me it's like a prayer yeah 
absolutely it absolutely beautiful i'm gonna take myself off spotlight and i think tony oh no janine has said such lovely words uh, thank you for sharing thank you thank you all right <clears throat> now then i think I ruth, sorry i think ruth had a hand in the air oh has you she want to ask something ruth Oh, I would I just interested if you could tell us how that poem came about, Polly. It's so beautiful, the words. I wonder whether there was something in particular that inspired you, or whether it took you a long time to really have a long gestation. Thank, thank you. I th think when I because I've got so much inside me I couldn't get my words out to my to my mouth and it, everything still you know in my head so when I got access to a computer I can get it all out otherwise with the handwriting it takes ages to write and I can't even read my own writing <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for, for that comment. Amazing. Now, what I'll do now is I'm going to go back into back into time back in time as a child, and I was okay until about um I got into my teens and thought. Everything I see around me is different. And, you know, I'm different. So people were not accepting me the way I was because they kept asking me questions. And why do you walk like that? Why do you talk like that? And so I couldn't answer it. I didn't, I didn't know myself what was going on, you know. And I hated going out with my parents. I didn't. I would hide away. I couldn't eat eat in front of people because I was thinking, you know, that they look at me and keep staring at me. I did. I hated that. <clears throat> and that was a big, big problem for me to accept me as I am, and I couldn't accept me because, because I I began to hate myself and I did not like myself at all. To my teens until I was 20 and in my 20s. <clears throat> and I really wanted, you know, people to like, like me for what I was. And that was a difficult part. And pe people used to say, handicapped, plastic. I hated those words. And I re that really got me in, into into there and I did, didn't talk to anyone I was always on my own I was really shy and and I used to go to Penn Hall School which was a school for disabled children physical and sensory disabled children and that school gave me my life because without that school I wouldn't have you know accepted the way, what the way life is for me and I'm going to share with you a little poem about my growing up it's it's called still smiling I sacrificed my youth for true affection. I loved that wasn't there. I sacrificed years of finding a connection, a link that was never there. I sacrificed my health in pain, in suffering that was wasted. I sacrificed my wealth, no gain. The money I never tasted. 
I sacrificed my desire to learn. The knowledge I cannot recall. Lost my freedom to spend as I earn. No one heard my frantic call. One thing I did not give up was my glowing smile. Mercifully kept my boat going. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. I mean, I can see why you were asked to be the poet laureate. <laughs> Can I ask? Can I ask you a question? Um, uh, you were talked to you. You talked about your teenage years, but can you take us back to a little bit to your earlier years and how old you were when you came over to um, the UK, and a little bit about what that was like for you and your family? Well, when when I was born in India. Nobody knew what was wrong with me, and they just sort of. My mother didn't even accept me. Well, she was saying she didn't like what she'd given birth to. <laughs> everybody says, just chuck her in the river. You should, you know, nobody will marry her when she grows up. You'll, you'll it'll be a burden on you for the rest of your life. So that was. That story is something that really gets me angry because I don't want people to suffer the way I suffered. And <clears throat> when I was three years old, my parents, my dad was already working in in the UK as a bus driver, and he he called his he wanted to go back to India to live in India and to manage his land. He's got loads of acres of land and he wanted to manage that. But when I was born, my mom kept saying, you know, you need to take her back to the UK. They can help her there. Nobody will help her here. You know, she'll be just chucked in the corner somewhere, you know? <laughs> so. That's, I was two and a half years old when I came to England. I don't remember a thing. <laughs> so, and from that, they enrolled me into Penhall School. And that school has done wonders for me. And, and, were, and were you there? Were you there as a you know, primary school all the way through to secondary school as well? No, I didn't go to primary school because actually Penhall School was not a academic school. They they taught people, it's like a hospital school. Mm. And they taught people poetry and they taught people, you know, how to go, go out to the seaside for a day. You know, they used to have weeks retreats at seaside resorts and I loved those days and when they used to say anybody want to stay in residence and my hand used to shoot up first I want to go so we had residence stay staying over for five days and that sort of gave me a life that I'd never I would not have had it if I'd gone to a normal school, you know, a primary school in the 70s. And see, the 70s, 70s was a hard tough time for people with cerebral palsy and, and other disabilities, of course. Yeah, I think we have, we have, um, we have really interesting we've had really interesting discussions in in our community over the last few years about the the special schools versus the mainstream schools and um there's been some wonderful friendships that i know of um from the special schools which you know to this day um are, are still prevalent i'm gonna bring um dean in because he's got his hand up yeah, thank you, you, Dean. hello Okay, hi, thank you very much. Um, 
for 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 being with us tonight. I just wanted just to show, you know you you said when you came to the UK that 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 things were better that things were better for you for being in the UK. A friend of mine was born in South Africa. She she had cerebral palsy, and she got treatment and she got a therapy and she got taught in South Africa, but it wasn't it wasn't to the standard that um that 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 um that it was when she came to the UK. Um, a bit, well, not just it, you know nothing was to this. She got she got very little it, actually. Is that that one thing in South Africa? But when she came, she like she got therapy, regular therapy, and 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 this that, and the other. So her life was transformed, and she was she was um, I think she was about sixteen or seventeen when she came over. Um, you know, and uh, and it just trans. So I understand why your mum fought for you to to stay in the UK because yeah. um, you know obviously the um you know um worked out for the best for you. Yes, of course. It's all good. That everyone's got their their stories. Everyone's got you know different perspectives of what you know to expect. But cerebral palsy, it can vary from you know from not from a little bit too severe, and I'm 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 just I'm just happy that I can walk and and talk a little bit, you know. So that's what I think. The UK have given me a life that I would not have had anywhere. Anywhere else in the world, you know, I I am really very thankful to the NHS. Although people cuss it all the time, but I'm really very thankful for giving me. You know, every time I've been to the hospital, they treat me really well. You know, so I can't say it's a bad thing for me. <laughs> So can I, can I, um, you mentioned when you were talking about your, the school, um, the, you know, the hospital school that you went to and that you, they talked, that you was the first time maybe you, you uh, experienced poetry. So could you tell us a little bit about your journey with the words and, and how you have explored and become um, such a skilled um what creative writer of course um when i was a child i used to go to my, my there was two teachers called one which is camp and one which is day and they used to recite poetry to us and i still can recite the owl and the pussycat from from memory all of it. I love that because they used to recite um little poems that I re that can get you all all your life. Once you've listened to them, they go with you throughout your life. And I remember when I was when I was at Penn Hall School, they did a. Uh, a play of the owl and the pussy cat, and I wanted to be the pussy cat, and <laughs> they said, "No, you're gonna be the sea." So I ended up being the way in the um, clock and I like the sea. <laughs> so that is a memory I never forget, and I the poetry has always been. Inside me, and I don't know how I became po po a poet really because I I used to like every that a diary every day of what I in my teens I used to have a secret diary that nobody else could read. No, but but the thing is, uh, my hand like I hand so so nobody else could read it anyway. 
And don't, don't, those were my best days of my life when I was at Penn Hall School. And when I, and then about when I was turned 13, my uncles said to me, why aren't you doing your 11 plus? I thought, what is an 11 plus? So they went to te the teachers at Penn Hall School and then they said to, to my uncles, no, she, we don't do academic. If you really want to do academic, um, you should take her out of school and put it into a secondary school. And that was the shock of my life when I entered, when I went to um, Colton Hill School. And I didn't, I didn't expect it to be like sober. Everybody had their um, bags and shoved people around, pushing people, you know, knocking me over sometimes. And my state, I was, I wasn't really stable. And I used to get, you know, pushed around. But I really loved, loved, loved that experience because it brought something that I would not have got if I stayed at Penn Hall School. And my academic was okay because from they put me into the lowest class first, thinking I had no no sense. <laughs> and then and by the end of the year I was in the top class. And yeah, and, and they said she got some intelligence here. You know, but I couldn't write it down. So, so they gave me a typewriter to, you know, write everything down. So in in exams, I was terrible, absolutely terrible, because I had to rely on somebody else to write the questions and the answers down and for me. And I, it was a terrible experience. And I failed all my GCSEs. <laughs> I'm pleased you can laugh about that now. <laughs> yeah, I got the got the telling off and got home and, and got the results and really told us you got you failed everything. You have to go back to school again for a year or a step, step in for another year. And it didn't improve that much at, at all. But I've I've passed a couple of my GCSEs. So. So that was my journey as a as a child for you know and when when I got to oh yeah one thing I forgot to mention when I was at Penn Hall School there was typewriters for people who who were severely disabled and I said to can I can I use the typewriter, please, please? I used to beg the teacher every day, can I use it? And they said, no, you need to learn how to handwrite yourself first. So, and every day, it was like a mantra, I really wanted to use the typewriter. <laughs> and one day the teacher said, I'll take, go, go, go on. And from that day, all my feelings came out through my fingers on, on the typewriter. So the typewriter saved my, gave me life to my writing. And and have you, when did you move from a typewriter to a computer? Uh, okay. <laughs> well, after my GCSEs, I got into a um why why which is youth training scheme in the council and they used to use typewriters then and it was I think eighties in mid eighties they're still using typewriters and then 
I think in the night nineties was the first time you know, we started using computers at work. So that was a big improvement because we had to use T-Pack pieces kept, you know, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> So wow. those, those days uh, were uh, were gone, thank God, because we had to keep, you know when, when you had to like pen letters for the same subject and we had to keep, put carbon paper oh, on. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> wow. So those days are... Uh, I'm glad I experienced it really because I'm not, my kids don't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> Shard and Becky, do you have a clue what Kali is talking about? I vaguely remember carbon paper when I was at <laughs> primary school and be, being sent to, there was a like a thing like a photocopier and you had to wind the handle. Yeah, Dean's nodding his head. That That's the bit that I remember about carbon. Maybe it was one up from carbon paper. I don't know. And it all came out pink. Yeah, yeah, pink and blue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, wow. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, I was going to ask, um, and this is probably a really difficult question to ask. This is the sort of question that I don't like being asked because I can't tell the answer because I haven't experienced the other thing. But I wondered... Do you think your experience, if you hadn't have had your experience at Penfold, you would still be doing what you do and have the same interaction with writing and getting words out on paper if you hadn't had that experience and those early teachers? Um, that is a difficult question because, you know, People ask me those, those kind of questions all the time. They say, if you were in, in India, what would you still have been a writer? I said, I, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe it was in the spirit of me, you know, you know or I just, because of my cerebral palsy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to get all of it get everything out it would have been difficult very difficult yes very very difficult um, people still ask me if you didn't have cerebral palsy would you still be writing i think i would but it would be a different perspective mm. yeah no that that is a very interesting um point that you make so I suppose you mentioned also um if I if I'm jumping and it doesn't work then let me let me know but you also mentioned that you started writing in a a, a writing circle with yeah. Punjabi um a group of Punjabi women can you well, that, yeah well, well that's very recent oh okay fine <laughs> but how is that how is that for you well it's, um... Because of, I think what what it, what it was, me and my publisher and 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 another artist, we got together, and we said, where can we see a gap for poetry? And we discussed it, and we said, Punjabi women are most likely not not to be able to write because of their responsibilities as a housewife, you know, children, grandchildren, everything. But I think what I found out was pretty much true. My because when I, when I got to got together pe people who wanted to write um it, it was very difficult for me to, you know, juggle their feelings because they kept talking. I said, shut up. You need to write, not talk all the time. Uh, I said, please listen 
to yourself and write what you write you write it down. And amazingly lots of poetry came out of that. And we are showcasing it everywhere in we got we got lots of uh, gigs. We got one in um Birmingham in next month. So it's all going very well at the moment. Yes. Amazing. So if I can take you back to when you left school and you started working on the YTS scheme. Yeah. Can you take us through your late teens and then on to the next few decades and how your life was and how your word like your your journey with words was because obviously you were using your typewriter at work but you had a job to do that's very different from letting the words flow through your hands as you as you put what you're feeling out what i used to do i i had a typewriter which i got from school the school gave me to keep it so you, you can keep it because nobody else is going to use it after, after you so I, I i took it home with me and so i used to write lots of little bits and bobs and show my friends my you know my i used to tell my sister to read it out to every every time i wrote something I would t- tell my sister to read it, and she got fed up of me. She got Chloe, just shut up, I don't want to know, you know? You know? And then, and then she, it's that sisterly teasing. And I used to show my my friends and my, I used to write about my friends and stories, little stories about my friends and give it, give, give it to them and fantasies with them, like actors, and I I used to be madly in love with Harrison Ford, would you believe it? <laughs> Harrison Ford and Michael J. Fox were my, you know, I was madly in love with these guys. <laughs> and I had posters of them everywhere, and, and the, I think those Teenage years was were difficult because I kept myself hidden away from public. Apart from going to school and back, I didn't go anywhere else. And I used to be so naughty sometimes, really, really. Um, because my mind was always playing, always ticking all the time. I I couldn't get my words up fast fast enough that I I wanted to I wanted to and and that that was the difficult part. So I would I and I would really I slowed down then I really but you know when you you're a teenager. You want a boyfriend, you want to be a couple of your friends, you want to go out, you want a nightclub. I couldn't do anything because of my culture as well. My dad wouldn't let me go out. He goes, you'll, you'll hurt yourself, I don't want you to fall down and hurt yourself, you know? And I had friends that used to take me out, but work, work was good. They they used to take, take me out to, to the pub sometimes and didn't know what a pub was before I was at, like in my at work and that was so such a weird thing because the only pubs I, I used to go to was the wedding when we got, got to the weddings with with my family and even weddings were traumatized and so I could when I used to eat, I, I, I didn't want to eat in front of people, so I went home hungry. And so it, it was all that kind of mentality 
And I didn't. But I was always trying to smile. I was always uplifting. And people used to say, Quilly, your smile is so amazing. I said, oh, me? How can I be so amazing? You know? You know? So, I'm going to can I just read a poem about. Let's see. Uh, my childhood. I'm going to read the poem about my life in one nutshell, and it's called Survivor, and this is a billionaire, and in the nutshell is my life story. Survivor. Entered the world like an uninvited guest. I hid away, embarrassed. I was a disgrace. Lord, I survived this sentence, a tough test. A child who was compared with all the rest. I was different, an alien from as a face. Entered the world like an uninvited guest. Very six wages kept me together, dressed. I was a cash point, abused without a case. Lord, I survived the sentence, a tough test. On display, two men for marriage suppressed. I was a British visa for Asian men to, to chase. Entered the world like an uninvited guest. A lucky escape, rescued by a husband, with a family, blessed with a family that I could love and embrace. Lord, I survived the sentence, a tough test. My dream came true, and all were impressed. A valid writer, poet, working mum, a place. Entered the world like an uninvited guest. Lord, I survived this sentence, a tough test. Thank you so much, Gilly. Gilly. Oh, oh, right, Becky. I was clapping. Oh, you were clapping, sorry. Oh yes, you're both clapping. Absolutely fantastic, sorry. <laughs> um, Kelly, can I ask you, you talked about um, your, you know, culturally your dad, um, it wasn't in your culture for you to go out um, socializing. And you managed to go with your work colleagues to the pub. Um, and how how did you, from a cultural point of view, how was that for you? Because you were kind of straddling two worlds there, weren't you? Yes, I, I think straddling two different types of cultures, two worlds, uh, two types of curly that. You know, I had to change myself for home. I couldn't wear, you know, skirts. I couldn't wear shorts, shorts, you know. And I thought, and my mum and dad were very strict about that. And they didn't want me to un uncover myself, you know, in public. So I was, I was, I used to, I was really naughty. I used to go to, um, go from home with a long coat on, and when I got to work, I took my coat off and put my little skirts on. <laughs> no, I was so naughty. But I That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be like a free bit of freedom to live what I wanted to see and do. And I was really copying the British culture because I just was very intrigued to find out what their life was like. And I think British culture is very, very different to our culture. But I think my children are lucky to have parents like me and my husband because we just let them do what they want, wear what they want, 
you know, but and then, and I, because I I felt when I was growing up, I was always kept under, you know, in a box. I didn't want to, I didn't want that. And the more you keep that kept in in control, the more you want to be bad. And the more you do stupid things. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Um, I'm going to bring Dean in. He's got his hand up. Um, Dean? Yeah, I he... just wanted to... I couldn't identify personally with what you, with what you said, um, Chloe, but, but the um, the thing is, I used to work... In, where I used to work in Preston, there were lots of Muslim women... There were, uh, in in we used to work for the company that I worked for, and there there some of the male members of their family always used to work there, and some of them used to who were work used to say you know we used to say are you coming out are you coming out with us all this that and the other, and it turned out that um well we, we used to say well I have to I have to be careful because some of my family work here and. If if I if I do if I do something that's too obvious, it'll be reported back to the family. So it, it's you know so women are very some women are very very restricted um, within the culture, and I just you know I just thought I, you know I you know I mentioned that same as you 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 mentioned the fact that you you had to you know you kind of had to change from work you know when you went home you had to. A bit like being an actress, I suppose. Um, you know, you have to go from one character perhaps to another, or, or, or you know, um, so so forth. But it's um, you know, certainly in terms of cult, you know, cultural, the you know, the cultural pressures that are on Muslim women are, are absolutely um, trim, you know, uh, are abs- you know, uh, a, a, a very very difficult for them. Yeah, and that's why I actually that's why I built the Punjabi women's writing group. I think the older generation they they got it tough, but the younger generations are gonna get it easier. Yeah, yeah. I think you've you've uh, you've paved the way for them to be able to stand on your shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> and walk through for a, a different a different future with different options um you very um you 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 just mentioned um that your kids are going to have it easier um because of the way you and your husband view things can you tell us a little bit about how you met your husband <laughs> oh dear <laughs> long long story <laughs> well what happened is when I was, I was just like, oh, how old was I? When I was about 18, my parents said to me, you have to get married now. I said, oh, but I don't want to get married, Mum. I'm, on, I'm, I'm only 18, 19, so I want to go out there and have a job and do what I want and earn some money. And they did not want me to do that. They wanted me to get married, and they said that if they found me a husband, which was my husband now, but at that time I was being, I was actually, um, trying to find a boyfriend of my own, and that that was a bit of a disaster because, I, and when my parents found out that I was I was sort of going out with somebody, they hit the roof. They absolutely hit the roof. Um, I was, I, I couldn't, sort of locked up in my bedroom. So, and you can't do that, you can't do that. And we did, me and my sister did some really stupid things. Like we sneaked out in the middle of the night just to meet these boys. <laughs> We went to Blackpool once in the middle of the night and came back at 3, 3 a.m. and my grandfather caught us in the, in the, you know, caught us. And 
he was disgusted with us. He says, you girls are disgraceful. You know? <laughs> what a rebel. Yeah, I was so mad. He was crazy. And then my I felt when my mom says when my um my mom and dad said to me, you could you should go to see this guy. I said, No, I don't want to see him. I've already got a boy boyfriend and I'm, I want to marry him. And the, that boyfriend did not want to marry me. It was not not a, not a two way street really, and I did I, I had some ups and really bad ups and downs in that time, which I've written about in my novel. Hopefully that will be published soon. I don't know when, but that's got all my teenage and my very. Versatile time of my life. That was the worst time of my life when I was 21, up to 21, and it was terrible. But when I sort of, oh, sort of settled down, calmed down a bit, and I'm, my, my husband now, he would actually. He stopped. I said, I, I, I phoned him up and, and I said, Please tell my parents I don't want to marry you, or you, you don't want to marry me. Please cut it off. I don't want to marry you. So he said, Okay, I'll cut it off then. I don't want to marry you. Right. That was the end of that for, for the moment. And then my mum and dad said, You can go with your uncles on holiday to India. And when I went to India, I ha I had lots of people after me, and I had no clue it was because of my British citizenship. I thought they loved me because <laughs> of who I was, but it was not. They were they were basically using me to come over to England and get a British visa. So that was those uh, three, four years of that, and when I, and then my husband too, actually my husband now, he came to England, and he started staying with my uh, at our house for a while. He wanted to go to America, so stayed stayed with us for a while, and when he was there. I actually fell in love with you. Oh. That is so lovely. I wasn't expecting that. Yes. Yeah. And I actually fell in love with you when he said, okay, I I I said to my dad, I'll marry marry him. I mean what else? You know. And I got married within three months of that. Yes. So I was married in 1994, yes, and, and that was a, a really lovely experience because I thought I would never get married. I said, you know, everybody had put in my head that nobody would like you, nobody would love you, but this Jasper, my husband, he's such a lovely guy. He's, He's taken care of me. He's done lots of things for me that I think no nobody will else would have done for me. And people ask me, has he got terrible palsy as well? I says no, he he hasn't. <laughs> so. Uh, so you just described um, some times where things were going really nicely and also things were quite challenging. And I've got this little image of you in your room with your typewriter, that you, you know, that is in your bedroom at night. And it's like, well, 
when is it that you spend your time mostly typing is it do you find that you as life got busier you had to make time to write or was it just when the emotions were there you you just wrote how how did it work for you well you know when I was younger I didn't I just wrote all the time, I didn't have any responsibilities. But when I got my had my kids, I got three kids now. One's twenty six, one's twenty two, and my daughter's seventeen at the, at the moment. And it was challenging to make time while being a mum, and. Working full time, and you know I had to get it out somehow. So I used to stay up at night, mid mid midnight, and wake up. At, you know I had these things I had to like. I got up at night, low for like three hours, and went to bed. And I, during my lunch breaks at work as well, and after work I used to depend. At, at, an hour or two after work, she's in, in the office and just writing. That was my time. Because as soon as I got home, I had my in-laws, I got my husband, I got three kids, all, all together. It was mad, it was crazy, my mad, mad house, basically. And my in-laws hated me writing. They said, why, why do you always write for what it going to come to? Nothing. You know, and uh, how I wrong they were, how wrong they were. <laughs> and now, when I tell them, I'm um, you know, I'm pretty locally famous, you know, no, not that famous, but and they really tell them, really. Um, can I bring Tony in now? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't need a hard time. It's most appropriate. Uh, I'm embarrassing myself. You know, the poem called Women Like Me, which sums up what you were just saying really well there. What I like about that poem and your poem, Partition of a Homeland, is that you're not just interested in putting the words on the paper, you're interested in the shape made by the words. How did you conceive of that, po of that poem? And the partition of the homeland. So you're talking about the poem that's shaped like a woman? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, how clever. Oh, how clever. That's really brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> My story out. It's going to be limited, and small, and quick, and I can't write forever. For and so I used to just like started writing poetry. Poetry is snapshots of life, isn't it? And the I think do you want me to read the a, a woman like yes, me. <laughs> Be well so constructed. Okay, okay. Let me have a have a little thing when my my voice is going. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> okay, this is called a woman like me. A woman like me should get a 
in the, in the early hours. Prepare and cook good food. Get kids ready with magic powers. <laughs> Have a spotless kitchen, bathroom, a dust-free house and make the beds. Shop, wash, wipe, clean, iron, put away. Do daily chores with love, care and pride. Then go to work. Be organised and tidy. Help the kids with the homework. Take them here, there, everywhere. Spur a demanding family without a single frown. Respect all her, to respect all around her. Speak at the right time. To know what her culture inside out. Have all the energy and never give up. To keep on going, serving all and everyone. Like, 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 live like other women, behave and resemble proper ladies amongst the new society. Be clever, intelligent, beautiful, sensual. Last but not least, be a goddess in bed. Yet, to serve herself, Feels like a crime. Strong, tough, expectant lifestyle. Sometimes she does not want this. She wants to be somewhere else. Someone else to sit and just watch herself. A woman like me, hey? Except I don't know a woman like me. I only know me. Right. And you, and you mentioned about Tony, Tony, you mentioned that my poem about the partition. You said how I like the, why I like the partition poem. Oh dear. Bear with me, Tony. But this is the one you're talking about. Yes, this is the poem about for a partition about my India and Pakistan, and it was like very tough to write that because I had to like I had to go and ask people they like my father-in-law um he was only 11 years old when the partition happened. And he remembers quite a lot of stuff. So I asked people what their stories about what happened in partition. And it was terrible things that came out of that. But when I wrote it, I had to, I, I thought, I like, I like it when I put partition, you know, a split between the, the words to make it look like it's a party. And that's what I did. Um, I'm not going to read this one. It's too tough. It's too tough to re read this. I'm, I'm not going to read this. I think, that, I think that what I love about it is, though, that it's not only about the words that you've written. It's about the way the reader experiences it. Like, with the you know the partition that you've literally created that on the page and 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 the body of the woman that Tony very kindly you know highlighted to us and and it's so playful Kali you're so playful with your words it's just fascinating so I suppose my a, a couple of questions that I have with you is that if we all wanted to try and think about you know how how we do if 
what tips would you give to people who've been you know I've been completely inspired by you tonight um and I'm sure uh, you know other people um are as well what, what what would you suggest that we could think about if we wanted to have a go ourselves I think if you if you really want to do something like poetry or clothes or even like just going walking or with the go to into nature what you need to do is find a group of like-minded people who will know what they're talking about you know it's like it's going to be somebody it's going to be a group of people who respect people who you know give you respect give you a chance to speak it's like you need that that's number one and um, number two is getting as much feedback from your people i think some people don't like some some of my work and and i know that but some people they love it so it, it, you need to balance it out and say it's it's going to be like if you really want to do something you'll do it you'll find somebody you're like i i really wanted to do something and i ended up finding a mentor and he helped me. We have tried, which was I was really, really, you know, because he he was the literature development officer at Wolverhampton Council, and when he got, you know, when the when when the government cut just cut lots of jobs, his job went a lot quicker. And so after that, he still mentored, mentored me after that. So that was a really good relationship with with him. And number three is to share and redraft, redraft your work until it sounds good to yourself. It's going to sound good to yourself because it's your work. And taking into account... If you want to perform your work to an audience, you need to know what the audience is going to be like. What are they going to be, you know, um, fully educated people or, you know, top level or just what we call public? Anyone, you know, it, we have to think about what our audience is going to be like. And send your work to public publications and magazines, and don't forget that rejection is part of the process. If you keep getting rejected, with that rag rag doll poem, I got rejected about about hundred times, and when I when it got accepted, I was joy, yeah, and. And that was in a proper magazine that got um it's a worldwide magazine called Insti um Place Initiative and they accepted me. So somebody out there will accept something if it's what they're looking for. And number five is never give up. The, if you if you have a desire, you want to fulfill it. You get battered. You get thrown about. Yeah, yeah. But it's like in being in a boat. You get stormed. You get lots of chucked around, and you get calm days and bad days. But then your your boat will still be uh, you know riding riding deep sea but you'll get to the destination one day <laughs> yeah that is fantastic absolutely amazing thank you for those top tips 
Um, actually, Becky, you you've got me ahead. I was going to say, any questions? I was just wondering. I recognise it's hard, and um, I think we've we'll we've all had experiences. Some of the experiences you've had, and not all of them, and different things will have perhaps had an impact on us. But you've got that unique intersectional intersectionality between being a Punjabi British woman and a woman with a disability in your case CP and quite often lots of people focus on the the stuff that must be difficult for you and hard for you but there must be some things that that allows you to do or allows you to express that you wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity I just wondered what the what the good things are, what the things are that you enjoy about the fact that you have that those unique experiences. Um, I think what's happened through my out my life, I've had it ups and downs like everybody else, and I sort of I think I never internally given up. Sometimes I thought. I want to end it. I don't. I don't want to live. I don't want to do this. And you know, some something inside me kept me going. Kept me, you know, stand up, Collie. You can do this. You can do this. You know, and one, I couldn't have done public speaking no way five years ago. If they asked me to do this, I could not have done it. And I think is people are there to help me help you to to do get, get the best out of you as well rather than just the worst out of you, you because when I was interviewed by the BBC I didn't want them to concentrate on the worst parts of my life because BBC, they always do that, <laughs> you know. But I took, gave them lots of different things to, you know, look at. And that story's been read over about two million times now. And so, it's, because it's so, so uplifting, I like to uplift people rather than just down in the dumps. I don't, I don't believe in that kind of life I've had enough of that in my life but I've always visited them and I thought um, um, my writing also expresses my fun fun personality I do some daft things but that's just me <laughs> you know and, and also I let me just read one more poem which which is was broadcasted on BBC Radio 4, Poetry Please. And it's a short poem, and it's called Born Drunk. As I walked down the street, old Asian women began to think. They stared at me head to feet. Oh, she had too much to drink. Babbling nonsense, I wasn't torn. Yes, I said, God sent me tipsy, drunk, a party before I was born. Desperate for oxygen, but drunk whiskey. That is brilliant. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um I've got another question to ask you, Kali, but I wanted to open it up to everyone else as well, because I know that there are some other people that might want to ask questions before I before I ask. So if anyone wants to, go for it, Dean. Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's regarding to that, you know, you said you, you like to uplift people and you certainly uplifted us. Was all, well, you certainly uplifted me tonight, you know, and and um, you know, and thank you very, very much, you know. And I, I also like that point you made about the 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 poem that you had rejected a hundred times, and then eventually somebody 
you know, somebody accepted it and, and, and it was accepted and, you know, had, and how thrilled you were. So, you know, it's um, just goes to prove, you know, you should never give up and at the first attempt and keep, you know, just keep going. So thank you for up, for up with giving me anyway. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Um, anyone else before I ask my, oh, my question? Okay. I can't see any other hands. So I wanted to just um, ask you, within your community, within the, uh, the Punjabi community, did you know anyone else with cerebral palsy when you were growing up or have have you found people have reached out to you now because obviously you're quite a big icon within your community I'm just wondering what your experiences of that were to date yes when when I was in Penhall school when I'm in the 70s there's I think I was the only one with Asian girl there and apart from there's two other um boys from the the Asian community there. So I did not really know anyone like myself at all throughout my whole life until they published the BBC article on the World Wide Web. So that was, I had millions of emails from all over the place, you know, I couldn't get a job with them. Uh, but probably I've met, I've made some really lovely friends in different parts of the world who have cerebral palsy and are and they're struggling at the moment too with their lives. And they keep asking me questions about how I did, did it and how um, they want to do it. For example, somebody thinks they couldn't get married. And I said, yes, yes, you can. If you've got something in your head that you will get married and somebody will come along. and. You gotta keep that in your head to make make sure you get, you know. But it's difficult for people who who have negative parent negative people around them. So I I don't know how to respond to people like that. So I have had it like that, but now I I'm positive. I like to be positive. I do lots of. Things about positiveness. So yes, that's amazing. That's such um um fantastic insight. And I think that um whatever challenges you know um what you were talking about right at the beginning about the smile and your smile and your energy. I think you know we we can all if you don't mind sharing some of that, because that's what you've done tonight, you know, like Dean was saying, it's just it's such a wonderful um, piece of, of advice to go forwards with um, just generally for everything. So um, I just, I wanted just to um, say a very, very big thank you, Kali, for joining us this evening. I've had the best evening 